Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, nice to see you all here. It was also nice, I, I assume you agree with me that it's nice to see winter back for a little while. Um, I was kind of missing it when it was all just sort of gray and raining. Yeah, I know it's sort of a pain to walk in the ice and we're supposed to get a lot of snow tomorrow, but it's still kind of nice to see it back. Um, Somebody's been leaving a message uh, that we should be wearing masks, I think, because there's several there, there's several there, but just if you're sick, put a, you can wear your mask. If you feel fine not, it's okay too. Uh, I'm sort of fine. I haven't really said anything about it. I know the official rule is please wear a mask in all classroom settings, uh, but we've obviously largely been ignoring it. There's some of you have been, some of you have not. I'm just not going to say anything about it either way. Uh, one of the reasons is, uh, I assume that if you have a cold, uh, if you have the flu or something, that you would probably stay home uh, because you can watch the live stream. Uh, if you want to be in the lecture and are not sure, uh, by all means, uh, it's a great idea to wear a mask. But I'm not going to say anything about it one way or the other. I lectured all year last year with a mask on, uh, and it is kind of, it's kind of irritating to wear it while you're talking. So I'm not wearing one while I'm lecturing. Uh, and hopefully every I didn't actually leave these here. I think somebody else probably left them there ahead of time. So uh, that's the official policy. You all know the official policy. Uh, I'm making an announcement to everybody that masks are uh, expected in the classroom setting. Uh, but uh, I'm not uh, going to say much more about it one way or the other. So uh, use wear as you as seems needed. Uh, but my key thing, though, and the reason why I'm being less um, uh, dogmatic about it is because if I, I'm assuming that if you are sick, uh, that you would probably be home uh, watching on TV uh, in the from the comfort of your own uh, home or somewhere else or something like that. Though by all means, uh, if you're sick and you want to be here, uh, put the mask on too. So does that seem? Does that seem like a reasonable way to sort of address the clear university policy that masks are required, but the obvious reality that they're not required anywhere else in society? Uh, and this is the one case where you're actually not talking very much and there's lots of uh, airflow. So it doesn't seem like it's, you know what I'm saying. Uh, does that, okay. So let's get started. Oh, I should, and to those of you that are joining online, you can wear a mask too if you'd like uh, or not, um, but thanks for joining. Let's go ahead and, uh, am I, re yes, I am recording already. So let's go ahead and start our lecture for today. Um, as always, I will start off by saying my goal is to try to complete everything <laughs> by 12 o'clock or 12.10 if we can. Uh, if I don't get sidetracked or thrown off or off on a tangent, I think we'll be able to do that. Um, so let's start with just a little bit of mention of the quiz. We'll do a little bit of review, uh, and then we'll cover the content. I mentioned at the beginning of the, the course on the first lecture that this one lecture, lecture number three on memory, probably overlaps with stuff you've taken before. So if you've taken 2135, which many of you have, some with me, others with Dr. Campbell or a few of the other uh, uh, instructors that teach it. Uh, so you've probably come in contact with some of this information before, and some of it's also covered in Psych 1000. Uh, not all of it, and not in exactly the same way. So this will be the one class that probably feels like we're doing some stuff that's review. Uh, that's fine, because you probably haven't thought about it for a few years. Uh, so it's a good idea to review that information anyway. Um, so let's talk about the quiz. Quiz number one is available uh, from 12.30 p.m. Basically, as soon as the class is over, you can take the quiz. Um, it's online, it's on OWL, it's 12 questions, uh, multiple choice, you got 15 minutes, it's a linear format. Um, it's available from 12.30 till 11.30. The course outline says something like 10, uh, it's actually 11.30. Uh, so you can take it any time between now and then, uh, but you only have 15 minutes once you start. So it's like a standard online assessment. It's timed. Uh, it's a linear format. Just take it when you've got time to do it. Um, it's going to cover units one through three. So the first class, the similarity class, and this class. Uh, so everything we talk about today, some of that will show up on the quiz. Um, there are going to be 12 randomly chosen questions from a set of about 15 or 16. So most people will have 
some of the same questions, but you won't always have the same questions. And they're gonna be a different order for everybody and the answers are uh, scrambled as well. So uh, yes, I recognize that you're gonna be taking these on your own. You can take them with other people, obviously. Uh, there's nothing I can do to stop that. Uh, it's an open book, open note quiz. So you should have access to everything. So I don't mind if you're taking them together, uh, but everybody's doing them individually. Uh, and your questions won't always be exactly the same as someone else. Uh, so they're drawn randomly from this pool. And the marks will be posted tomorrow. Uh, basically, as soon as everybody's finished, uh, you will receive the mark, but you won't get the questions themselves. Uh, so you'll get the score out of 12. It'll show up in the grade book and it'll show up on your assessments. Uh, but I don't post the questions and answers, uh, mostly because I like to keep the questions for maybe reuse uh, on another quiz or maybe on an exam. So that there's going to be material this week, would you recommend that we do the readings before we write the quiz? I would recommend that, yes. Uh, I would recommend that you skim through the readings today. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I'm giving you all day uh, so that you can uh, look at everything. Uh, you've got notes from today. Uh, look through the textbook. And when you're ready to take the quiz, of course, since it's open book and open note, have your books open, have your notes open, uh, and then begin the quiz. Oh, is the quiz going to be primarily lecture-based or like primarily textbook-based or mesh between the two? Mostly between the two and most of the overlap is going to be stuff that it was covered in both cases. There are some examples of things that I talk about in lecture, which are not covered in the textbook. Uh, one example uh, that we talked about last week was the um, experiment by Rips with the quarter and the pizza. Now, I'm not sure if I have a question on that or not. There's always a question on the midterm. <laughs> on that one. But I don't talk about that in the textbook. Uh, similarly, there will be definitions that I don't always get to the topic in lecture, uh, especially those bold uh, topic, the bold face uh, terms that are defined in the textbook. I can't get to them all in the lecture, but I often asked about them in uh, the quiz. So it'll be an overlap, mostly things that I've talked about that are also in the text. That's the majority. Uh, but you can you can usually guarantee that there'll be some things that I talk about in lecture, like today I've got new content that's not in the textbook, uh, and there'll be some things that are not talked about in lecture in the text that also show up. Does that seem clear? But by far, the majority of stuff that I emphasize on quizzes and exams are those things that overlap, uh, that are covered both in the lecture and uh, in the textbook. Let's just quickly review stuff from last week. Uh, I've got two slides of review and a little bit of question and answer. Um, what are the four models of similarity that we discussed? So what's the first of the four? Geometric. geometric model. And what are the assumptions of the geometric model? How does it work? Uh, there's the um, assumption. There's the... Um, so the minimality assumption, the symmetry assumption, and triangle inequality. Triangle inequality. They're all related to this other sort of fundamental assumption, of course, that psychological similarity is an, an analogous is analogous to option. Did I did I get it started by saying something that <laughs> oh, did I did I say like a sound that was like the word Siri? I didn't want to because the hey, I don't want to say it again. The hey Siri sometimes throws you off a little bit if you're talking in a way and that word's just sort of accidentally heard and you're driving along uh, and then all of a sudden. All right. Well, it, these things happen, right? This is that's no need to apologize. This is part of <laughs> part of part of modern life. Um, so they're all related to the idea that psychological similarity is an analog for physical similarity. That was model number one. And by the way, that was the answer to question uh, number two. Uh, so uh, what are these assumptions? Uh, we talked about those experiment, uh, experimental data. So what's the second model we talked about? The contrast model. Contrast model. And what are the key assumptions of the contrast model? Sure. Uh, that basically people's individual knowledge to take into account, so like the 
order that it just be laid out, like the, the comparison can be made out matters. Right, so the order can ma sometimes matters because your knowledge of the things that are being compared uh, also is taken into account. Uh, and that model you, assumes that you, uh, that similarity is measured by shared features between the two things that you're measuring, but also the distinctive features of thing number one and the distinctive features of thing number two. Sometimes your knowledge isn't even. The third model that we talked about. Anybody remember that one? Yes. Transformation model. So the transformation model, what are the, how does the transformation model work? What does it, uh, what is it designed to deal with? Actually, it says that things can change over time, so they may not look similar, but if we know that one can be transformed into the other, then we see it as similar. Right, so that heightens the similarity when one thing can be transformed into another. Uh, now, I talked about it in lecture just briefly, but in the text, I go into a little bit more detail um, about how tr similarity can be measured by the number of steps it takes to transform. The more things are, you know, the more steps it takes to transform one thing into the other, the farther apart they are uh, in terms of similarity. Uh, there was a th fourth model that we talked about, and this one isn't covered in the textbook, but we did talk about it in lecture. And we talked about it as a way to describe some of the shortcomings of the contrast and the geometric model. So the alignment models, uh, the alignment models make the assumption uh, that features are more flexible uh, than can be sometimes managed by a feature-based model, like a geometric model or a contrast model. Uh, and alignment models assume that you can only compare things if the features are alignable. Uh, and so sometimes that means relationships. Uh, so you can compare things if they have the same uh, you know, if they have the same role or the same uh, functional role in a set of objects. Uh, you can compare things if they are able to be aligned uh, in terms of their functional similarity. Uh, so I didn't talk about that one in the textbook very much, uh, but you should at least be familiar with the, the name and the basic uh, description of the alignment model. Does that sound good? So I think that kind of encapsulates what we talked about last week. Uh, this other slide basically just answered, uh, asked the question that we answered at the beginning. Uh, so there are three assumptions. Uh, in the quiz, I don't think I go into this much detail, but in the midterm, just to let just to forecast a little bit about the midterm, which is coming up on the 14th, um, I usually have a few questions where I ask you to remember some of these examples uh, for which, you know, how the minimality assumption doesn't work and uh, maybe an, ex an example of an experiment that would show minimality not working. Same thing with symmetry and same thing with triangle inequality. So remember those examples and maybe be able to re-describe them in a short answer question. Uh, I won't necessarily ask about all of them. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't, but that's a question that often shows up. Uh, so you can sort of guarantee that some of that information, because I emphasize it a lot. I mean, that was like, 45 minutes worth of one of the lectures. So of course I'm gonna ask about those types of things. Does that sound good? Let's talk about memory. So uh, the question here is, or the topic for today is what do we use the past for? So there's lots of different cognitive psychological approaches uh, to describe what memory is. And you probably covered some of these in Psych 1000. You definitely covered some in 2135. And most of this is stuff you probably know uh, from just general uh, awareness of popular psychology, right? How different kinds of memories work, uh, different ways to divide memory. Uh, but we wanna couch this or frame this within the context of what do we use memory for when we're thinking? So let's start talking about that. How do you use memory in thinking? Then we wanna talk about some specific theories and models of memory. And then in the second half, we'll talk about memory errors, mistakes, and so on. Um, any kind of intelligence system, and this could be, uh, humans, uh, as us, we have an intelligent cognitive system, uh, but it could also be non-humans, dogs, cats, bugs, and non-human primates, uh, all have some degree of reliance on memory. Uh, and any kind of computer-based inter artificial intelligence system has to rely on the past uh, to be able to make predictions about the future. So what we use the past for, the reason we have a memory, is so that we can do things better in the future. Uh, which is kind of a funny way of thinking about memory. Uh, we usually think about memory as 
go into the past, right? You know, you remember things that happened in the past. But the reason we have a memory is not to remember the past. The reason we have the memory systems that we do is so that we can be, uh, we can adapt for the future. So the memory is really more of a future-oriented psychological construct. Uh, what we've done in the past lets us make predictions about what's going to happen in the future. And as we discussed last week, we use similarity there, right? So if you're in a current situation that is similar to what something you've experienced in the past, uh, you recognize that similarity and you can use those past experiences to guide your behaviors in the future. So we have the ability to learn and remember things. Uh, we use the past to guide our future behaviors. Uh, memory is recognizing that a pattern of activation that is occurring now, so whatever's happening now, uh, as being similar to a pattern of activation that has occurred before. So in all the different ways we're going to define memory theoretically, uh, cognitively and uh, biologically, this is what holds it all together. We recognize that whatever's happening now, the pattern of neural activation, uh, what's happening now is similar to a pattern that has happened before. We can measure that similarity uh, and experience uh, the past again to help us make uh, predictions for the future. And these can be simple memories. These can be more complex memories. We can do it uh, willingly. We can you know, try to remember things that happen, uh, but often we don't, we do it implicitly or incidentally. We encode information uh, and we use information without realizing we're accessing the past. So we rely on memory to plan interactions. Uh, so when we're interacting with people, we're interacting with things, we do it the same way we did before. Uh, every time I come into this classroom, which I've used now two classes in a row, uh, I know where things are. I remember where the uh, microphone is stored. And I remember to look to see you see the red light there? My battery is going to die in about two minutes. Uh, it's, it's blinking on the front, the little battery signal, and then everything's going to die. You're not going to be able to hear me. So I always remember to check this. I checked that it was green <laughs> when I first turned it on, and then I check it every so often, and it, I don't know how long these things last. I feel like this is extraordinarily wasteful because I also recognize that I have to replace these on a weekly basis. So there's like a whole landfill's worth of little tiny batteries. I feel like we can do better, um, but if you wanna be able to hear my lecture, I've gotta have a microphone. So let me turn this off. Like it's blinking. About a minute. And I've got this, like, not only is it probably hard for you to hear me back there, but the people joining us, People joining us online will be able to hear me. All right, so I'm planning my interactions, how to interact with the uh, system. These are things that have happened before, so I remember doing them before, and I know that I have to do them again. Um, we learn new skills. Uh, there was a time when I didn't uh, live stream lectures uh, on YouTube uh, or Zoom, um, but last year, two years ago, I had to figure, most of us had to figure that sort of thing out. Uh, most of you probably didn't take classes online uh, by watching Zoom uh, videos until a few years ago, right? But you've come to, a, I wouldn't say come to appreciate it, uh, but you know how to do it, right? We've learned a lot of these new things, and every time you do it, you get a little bit better at doing it. Uh, we select the appropriate behaviors. We talked last week about how experts use their memories to solve problems more efficiently and more effectively than novices because they don't have to go through many steps. They can just remember solving the problem before uh, and do it better. Uh, we also make risk perceptions uh, using our memory. So we remember whether or not a behavior was risky and we can assess whether or not we should try something again. Um, so for example, now this, by the way, is not a picture of my child. I would never let this happen. Uh, this is just what happens with, basically anytime you see a picture of anybody, uh, it's just some random thing that I pulled up on a Google image search. So I just typed in a uh, child grabbing a stove. Uh, and you can see here that this is a staged photograph 
Uh, the handles are turned far away. There doesn't appear to be any gas on, uh, but the little kid is reaching up. Who wouldn't want to reach up, right? So what the, from the child's perspective, their memory is every time uh, there's something going on in the kitchen, one of my parents is standing here doing stuff. And shortly afterwards, it's time to eat, right? So this looks like something that's really interesting. Uh, so from the kid's perspective, uh, they want to be near this because they see other people doing it. The people that they spend all their, uh, you know, the whole day with, uh, their caregiver, their, uh, you know, one of their parents or a grandparent or something like that. Actually, this is unsafe. I can see this stove is on, turned on right here. So somebody's taking a picture instead of stopping the kid from reaching up to the stove. Um, so the kid's using their memory to want to be by something that they've seen in the past. They've seen their parents here doing stuff, uh, spending a lot of time there. If their parents are spending a lot of time there, then of course they should wanna spend their time there too, right? Um, however, uh, from the parent's perspective, they don't want their kid there, right? You don't want your child, your toddler, uh, reaching up and potentially pulling something down uh, onto them uh, from the stove, that would be dangerous. Uh, so what you usually have to do, what would you normally do in this case, aside from taking a photograph and posting it? You know, you'd say no, right? You'd, you'd say no in a slightly threatening and maybe kind of scary sort of way, right? You wouldn't, you know, scream at them. That might startle them so much that they, you know, freak out and bump into the stove or something. Uh, but you might say no in a stern sort of attention getting sort of a way, right? That maybe lets the kid know that what they're doing shouldn't, they shouldn't do again. Because what you want is not the memory of, oh, this is a place I need to be. You want them to have some memory of, this is a place that when I'm here, uh, my parents seem a little agitated. Uh, and they, they speak to me in a tone of voice that I feel uncomfortable with. Uh, and then they move me away, right? And so what, the, what you want the child to have is some kind of memory uh, available to them. So as soon as they go near the stove, they know that they're probably, their parents are gonna either you know, move them away or sort of you know, say no in a stern, in a stern voice uh, that gets their attention. You want the child to have some kind of memory that when they go near the stove the next day, they say, well, you know what, the last time I was here, it didn't end well. Uh, my parent, my ca the caregiver was unhappy with me. Uh, kind of yelled at me and pulled me away. And I just don't want to have to deal with that again. So I'm just not going to go near the stove. You want that to be the first thing that comes to mind so that the child doesn't have to have an accident. Eventually, they'll be old enough to get near the stove, right? But for a small amount of time, you want them to have something in their memory that's easily available that says, stay away from the stove right now. So we rely on what's most available in our memories to make decisions and to plan behaviors. For the most part, this is a good thing, right? Because you don't want the child to have to go through the experience of actually burning themselves. Uh, you don't want the child to also uh, have to reason through some kind of system too, which they don't have access to yet, uh, to say, well, if I'm near the stove and it's on, I probably shouldn't go near it because there's the potential of me pulling something down and burning myself. You don't want all of that. All you want is the first thing that comes to mind this is not a good place for me to be right now. I don't exactly know why, but I have this vague feeling that my parents will be upset with me. So I'm just gonna back off because I wanna avoid that uh, feeling. So you want that to be available. Uh, that's a good thing, that kind of availability heuristic. Child doesn't have to reason through anything. They just remember bad thing happened last time. I just wanna avoid that bad thing. So I'll just stay away from the stove altogether and go over there. So we assess risk based on the available evidence, but sometimes it's referred to as the availability heuristic or the availability bias. Uh, and this is one of the first cognitive biases we'll talk about. And it's probably one of the most salient and familiar uh, to all of you. And it's the one that kind of underlies a lot of the other biases we'll talk about. We make decisions based on what first comes to mind. Uh, most of the time that's great, but sometimes that leads us to make mistakes and errors. So how is it a bias? Um, so, there's a lot of different things that suggest uh, our memories uh, are short reliance on things that depend on different contexts. So let's think about the availability, the biases you've had in your memories uh, with respect to our pandemic uh, that we are still in the middle of, 
Um, but it's a different pandemic than it was in March, 2020. How many of you were first years in March, 2020 at the beginning? So the majority of you were first years. Um, how many of you were living in the residence in that? That was horrible, wasn't it? I mean, you're like, it seemed to me like it was a really tough time for students that first year because you're living in residence and then everybody just got sent home. Uh, like one weekend, they're just like, you know what, everybody, you got to go home. You don't have a chance to finish your year. You don't have a chance to say goodbye to your roommates or friends, everybody out, right? Do you still remember that being kind of a, so I would, I remember that, right? Because I, you know, I'm a parent of a university student who was also kicked out of their residence uh, in that first year. Um, so I think a lot of us have difficulty though, remembering what happens um, between March, 2020 and now. How many of you would say it's kind of a blur, except for maybe that first, I think a lot of us have that experience that, I mean, sure, things blur together, right? That's a normal thing that happens. Your memories kind of condense. You might remember things that happened, but not exactly when they happened. But I think it's a fairly well-established finding in cognitive psychology now in social psychology that we've kind of blurred things together uh, in our memories uh, in the last three years uh, because things were disrupted and also because a lot of stuff just kind of started to seem the same. Um, I'm not gonna go through either, both of these two articles, but I'd like you to sort of read them, I'm not asking questions about these on the quiz or the exam. This is just to provide some context. The first is a post that I wrote uh, in 2020 when I was like, I cannot stand another online meeting. <laughs> uh, and the second is an article uh, from an a, a outlet called The Conversation, suggesting that memory problems during the pandemic there's two kinds of memory problems that most of us have had during the pandemic. One, which we'll talk about in just a few minutes, is the real memory problems associated with COVID itself uh, and possible uh, memory problems associated with long COVID. The inflammation uh, that might occur in the cortex can interfere with your memory. Uh, and many people re report having some kind of uh, brain fog. You've probably experienced this yourself. I certainly did. Um, but the other kind of memory error is the one that these two posts are talking about, which is we've lost the normal context. And once everything starts to seem available uh, or everything starts to seem the same, it's really difficult to tell one thing the other, from the other. So I wrote this in 2020 about halfway through uh, the fall term, uh, thinking like, how much longer are we gonna, be? I didn't know it was gonna be like for another three years, but, um, so I said, a lot of my research and teaching work is able to be carried out at home and online. This is kind of true for most of us, right? I mean, you can do a lot of work online. Those of you that are joining online are doing your work online, right? We've adapted to it. But I began to notice some small changes, not just general fatigue with online meetings. And I hadn't had COVID at this point. I was just making more memory errors more than usual. For example, I might be talking with one graduate student for, uh, this is a graduate student in this case, for 10 minutes about the wrong project. And this happened more than once, where I would be meeting with one of my students, but I was talking about a different student's project. And like 10 or 15 minutes into our conversation, I would realize we are talking about someone else's project, aren't we? <laughs> talking about the wrong project with you. Uh, or I might confuse one meeting with the other. A lot of these mistakes, we'll, come, we'll talk about this in the next uh, half, are source memory errors. So I remembered the things, but I remembered the wrong connection. I remembered talking about a meeting or a, a project, but with the wrong person. Or maybe I remembered a meeting, but it was a different meeting or a different time. Um, I remembered the student, a topic and a meeting, but confused which one was which. And I was more like this so-called absent-minded professor than I used to be. Um, here's why though. And you'll see this throughout today's lecture and the second half especially, everything looked the same. And you probably noticed this, especially in 2021 when your entire year was online, everything started to look the same. Uh, we don't have to read through this whole thing, but this is what I noticed is that prior to the pandemic, as you probably noticed when you were first year students, you had lecture in a lecture hall. Maybe you would meet with a, a student, with a professor in their office. Uh, I would meet with my graduate students in my office and in my lab. I'd meet with other faculty in a seminar room or maybe a department meeting in a larger room. Uh, I might work on uh, 
course preparation at home in my home office. Uh, and then I might do data analysis and writing in my work office. So I had different places for different things. And when you are in a lecture like this, uh, maybe you leave the lecture and you continue talking about stuff. You could ask me a question. Uh, or as you're leaving, you could say, that was an interesting thing that came up, or I didn't like that idea, or I don't remember, it wasn't clear. You can have those conversations with your classmates right afterwards in the hallway. And then you leave and get to another class and you sort of forget what happened here, right? Because you can now switch. You've got a new schema, you've got a new concept, and you've got a new place. Once you come back to this classroom, psychology of thinking, right? We're thinking about psychology of thinking. You go to another classroom, you've got a different mindset. You've got a different frame of mind. But the problem was everything was on the same screen, in the same room, uh, on the same computer, uh, day in and day out. And I just could not tell one from the other. It wasn't like I met with one student on Tuesday in this room and then another group of students uh, on the next day in another room. I was just meeting with department meeting in my, in my home, converted spare bedroom office, uh, teaching in my converted spare bedroom office. And you probably all did the same thing, right? Uh, you would have every single class on your laptop. The same laptop, by the way, that you also would watch Game of Thrones on, uh, and that you might do uh, everything else on, right? So everything was in this one little screen for an entire year. It's no, re it's no surprise that you couldn't tell one thing from the other. And that's what that second article talks about, is that it's just your brain trying to make sense of the fact that everything started to seem the same. Uh, we used to, we're used to having different locations, different contexts, different groups of people to help us remember one thing from the other. They're different memory cues, different contexts. But once that all starts to seem the same, and it's just you and your laptop, and everything is coming through that one screen, it can be really hard to tell one thing from the next. Did you all experience something like that? I think a lot of people experience something like that. I mean, I got used to it after a while, but I still forget stuff, right? There's still periods of time during that 2021 and 2022 where I really don't even remember what happened uh, in each year. Uh, because so much of it seemed the same. So if you're feeling that way, you are not alone. Uh, most everyone else, unfortunately, feels like we've got this lost two-year period uh, where everything just kind of blends in. Um, the other one, of course, and this will you can read more at this. Again, I'm not going to ask you to read through this. This is just for your own uh, uh, just for your own reading, uh, is this idea called brain fog. And if you've had COVID, you probably experienced this. And many people experience it for a few months, weeks or months after uh, they've recovered from COVID. Uh, it has to do potentially with inflammation in the cortex. Uh, and that makes it harder to uh, separate the different memories. So on top of the pandemic, uh, everything blends together memory errors. Uh, people who are suffering from COVID also uh, have these this brain fog uh, phenomenon where you just kind of feel like you've taken cold medicine, right? Or you kind of feel like you had too much NyQuil. Everything is all right, but there's a little bit of fogginess and you're just slower to put things together. Uh, most people, even with long COVID, overcome that, uh, but it can take weeks uh, or months. These problems resolve, but they persist in others. Um, and it does seem to have something to do with this neuroinflammation, but it's also uh, still a developing disease, right? I mean, this particular uh, uh, disease has only been uh, studied for a few years now. Uh, and so people with a long version of COVID uh, who have suffered a few, uh, maybe two or three different infections or have been persistent brain fog, uh, it's not clear when that's going to resolve. And so a lot of this research is ongoing, Midwestern and lots of other places. Yeah. yeah like So uh, like based on excessive screen time research, doesn't that also contribute to brain fog as well? Because let's say if you watch like YouTube videos for like six hours and then you're just like you're mentally phased out just for like the rest of the day or like- That's going to cause brain fog. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So if you didn't hear the question, if you watch YouTube videos for seven hours a day, you were also going to have some degree of brain fog partially for that reason that we talked about before, which is everything starts to seem the same, right? I mean, if you, how many of you have ever fallen into a YouTube or a TikTok hole uh, where you just like, what, what have I done with myself? <laughs> wow, <laughs> what have I been doing with my time? It's four hours later and I am still doing this. Uh, everything starts to seem the same, of course, because both YouTube and TikTok's algorithms 
are picking up on what you watched and trying to send you something that looks like what you just watched. So not only have you just wasted uh, four hours of your day watching stuff, you've been watching the same kind of thing because the algorithm in TikTok and the algorithms in YouTube uh, want you to do that, right? They said, well, you know, they seem to like this video of earthquakes. Let's keep showing them more earthquake videos. And you keep watching more earthquake. Of course, you're going to get some brain fog, right? Because things start to seem the same. Yeah. Um, could be the wrong, pretty like ritualistic creatures. Yes. Nature with, I guess, not, not lack of desire, but negative consequences of familiarity and like consistency. And, so that, that that's a good question. If you didn't hear the question, uh, so you're asking about, you know, we also have a lot of rituals and habits. Uh, we tend to be habit driven. How do we reconcile that with the fact that in your habit, everything seems the same, right? Uh, well, one of the things that happens, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in the second half, is that we don't really remember those things very well. Uh, one of the reasons we have a lot of, especially morning rituals uh, and morning habits uh, is because we're not really ready to start thinking about things yet. Uh, we want to be able to put as little amount of effort as possible into those things. Uh, so I can't tell you exactly uh, you know, which coffee mug I used this morning. I think it was the greenish pottery mug because that's the one I use every day. So I don't know for sure. What I remember is the ritual. I remember the schema. We're going to talk a little bit about that today, but more next week when we talk about concepts. But the idea is, yes, as a matter of fact, we're actually going to lose access to that. Uh, so it actually, it really does make our memory for details worse because we remember the habit, we remember the ritual, but we can't point to whether or not we followed every step uh, this morning or yesterday because we're used to doing it over and over again. Is that okay? Yeah. I wonder if uh, brain fog is possible for kids who are uh, like nine years old playing game. Probably too. I think a lot of people get this, uh, this vibe uh, of doing the same thing for a while uh, and then having to switch to do something else. Uh, and it all sort of works. I mean, you can sort of see the similarities here. Uh, spending a lot of online meetings, falling into a YouTube hole, uh, or just the natural tendency, as you suggested, uh, to engage in sort of a habit every morning. We do it, but we don't remember the details uh, because we're so used to doing it. So what we remember is the habit or the schema or the larger order uh, event without remembering the individual day or the individual uh, example. Does that seem? When you mentioned like, the routine, you're focused on like the routine, it's similar to driving. Yeah, similar to driving. So when we talk about procedural memory in the second half, uh, driving is a perfect example. So if you didn't hear the question, uh, the question is, is this kind of like driving as a, as a routine? Uh, absolutely. Those of you that drive uh, on a regular basis, I'm sure there've been lots of times where you've started driving somewhere and you don't remember getting there, right? This happens really commonly. Uh, if you're driving from here to Toronto on the 401, which is never pleasant, uh, but you're doing it, and let's suppose the traffic is fine, there's no major... You don't remember the, how many cars passed you, right? Uh, you don't remember which cars passed you. You're not going to be able to remember uh, anything <laughs> uh, about the details, even though when you're driving and somebody passes you, you say, a car has passed me, right? A blue car has passed me. A white car has passed me. You could say that, but you're not going to remember them at the end, right? Because you're focused on driving. And then as driving becomes proceduralized, uh, all of that just gets ignored. Uh, that information is no longer stored. You're aware of it when it happens, but it doesn't get stored as part of your memory later on. That's a good example. All this, by the way, is a different kind of memory uh, confusion than the brain fog associated with actual COVID, uh, which seems to be a neurovascular problem, uh, which causes inflammation. Uh, and that is an area of study, both at this, you know, a lot of labs here at Western, uh, but lots of other research labs are trying to figure out and study exactly what causes the brain fog and what do we do about it, especially if it lasts for months uh, or potentially for years. So how can we treat something like that? Um, let's talk about some of the ways in which your memory is biased. Um, so this, go, this goes back quite a year, uh, a few years here to 2014. Um, but when it happened, 
uh, it was a chance for people, uh, especially uh, people in the media and people in the sports media in particular, to think about a phenomenon uh, known as the availability heuristic, which we talked about at the beginning. So this is an example of availability, uh, and it actually came up uh, in a lot of sports writing uh, at the time. So in uh, 2014, Ray Rice, who was a player uh, on the uh, Baltimore Ravens, uh, was uh, shown, there was a video of him assaulting his girlfriend uh, at the time in an elevator, uh, sort of beating her up, uh, and then she fell down and then he kind of dragged her out. So it was really a bad, uh, it was a bad look uh, for him. Uh, it was a bad event, right? Uh, so this got people thinking like, well, we can't tolerate this kind of thing, right? I mean, this is unacceptable. This kind of domestic violence uh, is unacceptable. Uh, and there were a few others. Ray Rice was the most high profile. And there was a video uh, of him beating up his girlfriend that was shown a lot, right? Now, 2014 is... Uh, sort of in the earlier days of social media, but Facebook was around. Uh, and of course it was shown on the news, it was shown on Google. Uh, lots of people saw this video of the assault. So considerable media coverage, wide availability of photographs and videos. It was shown on TV a lot, uh, it was shared. So a lot of people saw this happen. Do, you, do any of you remember this event? It might've, this quite, kind of a while ago. So. Um, Shortly afterwards then, a survey was done of Americans uh, and 70% of them endorsed the idea that the NFL at the time had a troubling epidemic of domestic violence. Uh, and so the question is, is that an accurate perception of players in the NFL? Is there an epidemic of domestic violence uh, or is that an overinflation based on availability? Well. Obviously, the reason I'm bringing it up in the class is that it turns out it's going to be an overinflation uh, based on availability. This poll was put out right after all of this. So people saw this video a lot of times, uh, which means that you're more likely to overestimate uh, the incidence of domestic violence among NFL players. Most of us don't have access to the personal lives of NFL players. Uh, we don't, certainly don't have access to their personal lives and we don't have access to uh, every arrest record uh, for every NFL player and every similarly aged uh, American male. Um, but it doesn't appear to be right. So why do 69% of Americans believe that the NFL suffers a widespread epidemic? The answer is rooted in how we think. Humans are prone to rely on examples and experiences that can be easily recalled. That's, the perf that's a great definition of the availability heuristic. You rely on things that are easy to remember. The first thing that becomes available in your memory uh, is what you base your judgments and decisions on. This mental shortcut, the idea is that if we remember it, it must be important. And this shortcut is termed the availability heuristic. The drawback is that occasionally, we overestimate the prevalence of memorable events. So by seeing that video uh, of Ray Rice assaulting his girlfriend, you overestimate how frequent it might be among NFL players, because we don't really have access to the statistics. Uh, we don't have access to all of the information. Remember, we talked about limited information being a challenge to the thinking process. Well, since we don't have access to all the information, the next best thing is access to something that is easy to remember. Uh, and what's usually easy to remember is stuff that just happened or stuff that is talked about a lot or stuff that is uh, highly salient or emotionally charged. And all of those things were true of uh, Ray Rice at this particular time. Um, comparing with the national average, of men in the United States age 25 to 29, which is the average age of NFL players uh, in the United States, um, NFL players uh, have a much lower rate of uh, whatever the arrest rates are uh, for any one of a number of different kinds of things that uh, young or uh, sort of young adults, 25 to 20 year, year old men in the United States might be arrested for, whether it's DUI, uh, non-domestic assault, drug-related disorderly conduct, domestic assault, gun-related violence, any of these other kinds of things. 
uh, the national average tends to be higher than what is seen among NFL players. Now, of course, some of that's selection bias, right? NFL players uh, are a very small group. Uh, this small group is likely to have a lower incidence than the larger uh, overall whole. But it doesn't seem to be the case that there's a troubling epidemic of domestic violence within the NFL outside of the fact that this might also be considered a troubling epidemic of domestic violence in general. Uh, so it may not be a problem for the NFL. It may be a problem you know, among American men in 25 to 29. Uh, you might not want to endorse uh, or assume that this is a, uh, an acceptable rate, but it's certainly not the case that it's true just for NFL players. Uh, it seemed to be an availability heuristic. People saw it happen, and so they assumed that it was more prevalent. This shows up in other cases. Um, so thinking or executing a behavior based on the first similar example that comes to mind easily uh, is known as this availability heuristic. So this comes from research that was conducted in the 1970s. So this came up uh, in uh, 2014, NFL players, but it's rooted in cognitive psychology uh, from the 1970s. So Kahneman and Tversky, and I mentioned last week, Kahneman and Tversky's name will come up a lot in this class because they've done pioneering work in the psychology of thinking. Um, they have a much less exciting uh, or uh, maybe a much less uh, dramatic example of the availability heuristic that usually works. Suppose one samples a word of three letters or more at random from an English text. So any text you could imagine, whether it's a book, a newspaper, uh, a news article online, just imagine something written in English and you pick a word at random. Is it more likely that the word starts with the letter R or that R is the third letter? What they found was that when they asked their participants this, uh, most people say it's more likely that it begins with the letter R. Obviously that's wrong or we wouldn't be talking about it. Um, so the reason is that the first letter provides a better memory cue. When people are asked this question, suppose you choose a word at random and which is more likely? It begins with R or R is in the third word. What do people do? They start thinking of words, right? And how do you think of words? You think of words by thinking of the first letter first because it's the first letter, right? So if you start thinking of R words, Think of lots of words that begin with the letter R. Um, none of us have very much experience thinking of words that have R in the third letter. In order to do that, you got to go through several steps. You got to think of a word, then you have to visualize that word and count to see if R is the third letter. So you're just picking words at random then from your lexicon, uh, which doesn't seem to be organized by third letter. It's organized by first letter. So what happens is most of us, uh, most people just remember more words that start with R like the word random uh, and don't pick up words like the word word which have R in the third letter. But there are a lot more words in the English language that have R in the third letter than start with the letter R. It's a much more common occurrence. Uh, most people don't realize that when they're asked because that's not how we search for stuff. So you, the availability heuristic plays out because you overestimate the probability of words beginning with R rather than words having R in the third position. So not a very exciting example, but one that holds up and can be replicated. Um, another example they had, um, consider the next question. Please assume that Steve was selected at random from a representative sample. So whatever community you're in, you can choose a representative sample of people in your province, state, country, whatever, uh, and you pick a guy named Steve. And then you're given a personality description of Steve. Um, Steve is very shy and withdrawn. Invariably helpful. He's a helpful, shy guy. Uh, but with little interest in people or in the world of reality. A meek and tidy soul. He has a need for order and structure and a passion for detail. Now, this probably might not, I mean, it might not fit anyone in particular, but it probably calls to mind an exaggerated stereotype of a kind of person, right? Uh, this is a, uh, you know, it doesn't actually say that he's 
small, but I kind of picture a small guy, right? Uh, I kind of picture someone who doesn't like to take up much space, uh, someone who is a meek and tidy soul. And then I ask, then I'm asked, kind of in Tversky asked them, which is more likely? If you had to choose, do you think it's more likely that Steve is a librarian or a farmer? Uh, which seems more, uh, how many of you would say librarian? Uh, how many of you would say farmer? Um, so could be either. And in almost every Kahneman and Tversky example, you'll find that it's about a 60%, 30% split, right? So 60% of people will say librarian and about 30 will say possibly a farmer. No right answer here. But what they were interested in is why do people tend to prefer librarian? Um, the reason uh, is that the resemblance of Steve's personality is that of a stereotypical librarian strikes everyone immediately. Now, this might have been true in the 1970s. I think it's probably not as true now because librarians do more now than they would have done. Uh, this is not someone who might be uh, working in a book repository. There's lots of other things that librarians do. So if anybody's interested in library science, I don't want to say anything about the stereotypes of librarians. This was chosen to be a stereotypical librarian, not an individual. But statistical considerations are always, almost always ignored. Did it occur to you that there are more than 20 male farmers for each male librarian in the United States? Uh, so in the United States, wherever you sample people, the ratio of farmers, people involved in farming uh, to library science is about 20 to one. So no matter where you choose somebody, they're more likely to be a farmer. Uh, regardless of personality characteristics, just based on probability alone, you got to 20 times more likely to pick a farmer at random uh, in the United States. Um, because there are so many more farmers, it is almost certain that more meek and tidy souls will be found on tractors than at library information desks. So setting aside the personality characteristics, you got 20 times more farmers than uh, librarians. You should find people of all different kinds in farming and you'd have more likelihood uh, to pick a farmer. Again, this is not the right or wrong answer. The key if piece of information is that when people see that stereotype, what comes to mind uh, is possibly a librarian. What does not come to mind for most people is, seems like a farmer. Uh, and so that's what drives uh, your decision-making. That's what drives your judgment. Uh, again, this is an example of a heuristic uh, being used in decision-making. Um, final example, and then I think we'll wrap things up. We'll go through this one a little bit more quickly because I'm just going to go through a bunch of slides, but this just gives an example of the availability heuristic. Um, in the middle of the 20th, the, uh, the 2010s, in the United States, there was a fairly strong and well-supported belief uh, that there was a coordinated war on cops. Does anybody remember hearing that expression maybe about 10 years ago uh, in the U.S. media? Not did not occur in Canada. There was no war on cops in Canada, uh, but there was a war on cops uh, in the United States in the 2010s. Um, 2015, Sheriff Lewis, law enforcement officers are under siege. Investors Business Daily, war on police sparks national crime wave. Um, much of this came uh, as a result of what happens uh, sort of on a regular basis in the United States when there is uh, some incidence of police brutality, right? And then there will be protests uh, against police brutality. Um, and what people would often do is characterize those protests uh, as a war on cops. What I want you to notice though, is that the, the phrase is being used, right? It's not just reporting on something that happened, that there was you know, a, a police brutality incident and then there was a protest and maybe a counter protest. What's being used is uh, the headline, there's law enforcement under siege. Uh, there's a war on cops. 58% think there's a war on police. I mean, it's right there in the headlines, right? So you start to see this a lot, whether or not you've actually seen examples of the police being attacked is irrelevant. The thing is that you've seen this being reported. You've seen the headlines and you've seen the expression used over and over again. Uh, is it accurate? Well, I wouldn't be bringing it up if it was accurate. Uh, it, isn't, it was not accurate at the time. At the time that most of those things were collected, uh, police officer fatalities were on a downward slope. 
there were two peaks in the entire uh, century uh, where there were an unusual, lar unusually large number of police officer fatalities in the 1920s and 1930s. What do you think happened then? That was the era of prohibition uh, when alcohol was illegal in the United States, which then made it possible for organized crime uh, to supply alcohol, which meant that the police were either involved in organized crime or involved in trying to eliminate organized crime. So it meant that there was more there. And this was a period in the 1970s in the United States uh, where uh, drugs were criminalized more heavily. So there were two periods when a shift in what was legal and not legal uh, meant that police were more involved. Uh, outside of September 11th, when a lot of officers were killed in that one single day, uh, it's been on a downward slope uh, since the 1970s, and it continues that way. Um, this was true uh, for uh, populations per million. Uh, this is true uh, in terms of ranking uh, different, different um, uh, occupations that might be uh, perceived as having a high risk, logging, fishermen, uh, very risky uh, professions, uh, police officer, truck driver, and so on, uh, relatively less. Uh, so in terms of the fatalities and the danger, uh, it's not a particularly uh, uh, dangerous profession relative to lots of other things. There's always risks associated, right? Um, crime rates in the United States have been on a decline uh, since the 70s and even in the 90s. Uh, even the New York City Police Department uh, showed that officers shot and killed by people um, during the time when it was perceived that there was a war on cops uh, was starting to approach zero. It just didn't happen very often. This, by the way, at a time when the number of firearms in the United States was continuing to increase. So more guns in the United States, but still relatively little violence uh, in terms of officers being shot. Uh, subjects even being shot and killed by officers, despite the fact that there are more guns in the United States, uh, the police aren't using them that often. Uh, maybe you would consider eight to be too high, I would, uh, but it's not as high as it used to be in 1971. Uh, in New York City, 71 people were shot by the police. Uh, in uh, 20, uh, uh, 2013, it was eight. Uh, so police are not shooting as many people, and police are not getting shot as often. Uh, there are a lot more guns in the United States, but there's a lot less police violence than there used to be. But this doesn't seem to square, or it didn't seem to square with people's perceptions uh, because of how things were being reported. And so the idea is that the more you hear those things, there's a war on police or their police are under siege, the more likely it seems that it really is happening. Uh, that comes to mind. And so you use that availability heuristic to endorse uh, or to make judgments. We were having this discussion, uh, my wife and I were having this discussion on the drive-in, uh, just, I mean, you're all aware that there are mass shooting events in the United States on a regular basis that are really increasing, not just for the availability heuristic, right? This is a unique problem to the United States. Um, relative to other uh, sort of similar GDP sized countries. Uh, the United States has a disproportionate number of mass shootings. That's not the availability heuristic. That is a true thing. And so the discussion is how do Americans, I mean, I'm an American. How do my family all live in the United States? I mean, how do people deal with that? And one of the ways they deal with that is, uh, you know, sometimes by overestimating how likely it is, right? It does happen a lot, but for most of us, most people in the United States, it really doesn't actually ever happen personally. Occasionally, you might know someone uh, who was connected uh, to a mass shooting event. Uh, but most people, it doesn't happen. Even when it happens a lot in the United States, there's 250 million people in the United States. So most of them, it doesn't happen to. But this availability heuristic makes it seem more likely, right? So there are just more of these events being reported. Um, memory affects the thinking process for better or worse. Uh, and we're coming close to the end of uh, part one. It's 1030. So if you can bear with me five to eight more minutes, we'll get through this. Take a nice break. So memory affects the thinking process for better or worse. Usually it's for better, but sometimes it's for worse because it makes us overestimate the likelihood of low probability events. It doesn't happen very often that uh, 
you know, officers are shot by, uh, by suspects or that officers shoot uh, and kill suspects. Just doesn't happen very often. Mass shootings happen far too often in the United States, but they still don't happen that often relative to other things that can cause harm uh, to individuals. We overestimate them because they're things that are highly salient. Risk is assessed via memory for events and decisions are made according to those risk assessments. So here's the problem. Here's why I say for better or worse, the problem is that memory is not always reliable. Let's look at two quick examples for why memory isn't reliable and then we'll take a break. Uh, the first is one you've probably seen before. Uh, and this is an example called, there's two examples of a phenomenon known as change blindness. Um, in change blindness, if you haven't seen this before, I'll show you the video of, of the actual experiment. But what's going to happen is, I'll show you two videos. Um, this is an experiment that was done in 1998, but it ushered in a new phenomenon uh, at a new area of study uh, in attention and memory. And the idea is, and this goes back to some examples that some of you brought up, like the driving example that you brought up and the habit example that you brought up. We do a lot of things automatically, and so we're not paying attention. One of the assumptions we make about the world is that it's stable, right? Uh, I make the assumption that uh, people that are sitting in front of me are not gonna change. If one of you changed seats and I didn't see the change, I wouldn't notice that a person was sitting in a new seat because I just don't assume that it's gonna happen, right? So we just don't assume that the world's gonna change right in front of us. Um, we assume that there's continuity uh, in the world around us. Uh, what happened on minute one is going to be the same thing that's in front of you on the second, you know, the next second later, right? Things just don't change in front of you. The world is stable uh, unless you see it change. So what they did was they explored this in two different ways. Here's an experiment where one experimenter is asking for directions uh, from, a, from a subject. This is a pedestrian. Uh, he's got a map in his hand. And what he's asking is, how do I get to a certain building? Now, I kind of imagine this is a graduate student and this is an older professor, right? So I'm imagining myself in this situation. I'm standing there and someone asks uh, for directions. What I'm thinking about is giving directions. I'm not thinking about exactly what this person looks like. I'm assuming that they're asking directions. I'm thinking about spatial stuff. I'm thinking, I don't remember the name of that building, uh, that kind of stuff, right? What I'm not assuming is that the person is gonna change. So what happens is these two guys here, and you can see one of them here and one of them here, they're carrying a door and they barge in between the two. Uh, you can see this guy looks kind of offended. He's like, what, what the heck? Uh, and these, there's three guys here. This one guy here and two others here, and they've now changed place. So this person and this person are two different people. Uh, they've, he's literally talking to a different human being a few seconds later and doesn't realize it. Um, the world has changed right in front of him uh, and he doesn't notice. Uh, and they've determined that this happens quite a lot. People don't notice change when it happens uh, right in front of them. Which, by the way, when I was a grad student and I first read this study, I found this kind of disturbing <laughs> that things could change right in front of you and you wouldn't notice, right? Because I assume that the world is a stable place. Uh, but if you can assume that the world can change right in front of you and you won't notice the change, that's kind of an uncomfortable, I found that to be kind of an uncomfortable thought. Uh, let's watch the video. And then I've got a second video that's similar to this. Let's make it big here, even though it's not very high resolution. Uh, those of you that are watching on the uh, Zoom, by the way, you won't see this very well because I forgot to optimize it for showing video. Just click on the link and watch it yourself later. The door step. This video shows a participant from a 1998 study by Daniel Simons and Daniel Levin. Watch what happens. The unsuspecting pedestrian provides directions. The young man on the left is one of the experimenters. He has approached the white haired man and asked for directions. Watch closely as two people carrying the wall pass between them, and the first experimenter is replaced by someone else. She has no idea. It's a different human being in front of him. He has no idea. 
like many of the people in the study, the pedestrian was entirely unaware that he was talking to a different person. Approximately 50% of the people approached in this study didn't notice when the person they were talking to was replaced by someone else. This study was among the first to demonstrate that chain points can occur outside of the laboratory. This video is from Surfway. So your memory for stuff, now we've talked about how memory for things might fade over three year periods, like in the COVID uh, era. Um, what Simon's research is showing is that your memory is not even very good for things as it happens, right? Because you assume, you make assumptions about the world uh, that things aren't going to change, even though someone is right in front of you, you're using your active working memory to pay attention to them, uh, to give instructions and so on. Um, and yet we don't notice. So the memory is not very reliable. Uh, I want to uh, show one additional video. And then I think, is that the final one? Let's watch this second video, then we'll take a break. So on this video, oh, come on. No, I don't want that. Uh, all right, we just, no, there we go. Skip that. I have YouTube premium at home and I forget that there's ads. Uh, and so I'm not logged into my account. I can't understand how people could ex enjoy the YouTube experience without YouTube premium. All right, so in this example, uh, this is even worse because now we're gonna see something without a door going in front of us. You're gonna watch something on the screen and something is going to change and your job is to see what changed. Uh, so just try to see something change. That's the only, it's your only job in this task. And it's not even a fast change, it's a gradual change. Gradual change tests. Watch this short film to try to stop the change. Only one thing will change. Only one thing. Did you see it? How many people saw something change? I one. You think? I mean, you could all raise your hand because you were told up front that something changed. But if I ask what did change, usually a few people get it. You probably got it. Did anybody else think they saw it? I right, watch again. Even though it happened in plain sight, is what changed. So the shrub turned into a rock uh, slowly. We think changes draw attention, but we don't realize how many minutes go blind to our own change. Life. Now watch it happen now that you know. Now you know what's changing. You're going to have to Is that the one that you saw? No. Nope. Okay. Watch it again. And you can see it change right there. See, it's turning into a rock. Overconfidence that we changes reflects an everyday illusion, the illusion of attention. So the reason I bring this up, even though this is sort of attention uh, research, is that we've evolved cognitively to rely on our memories to make just about every decision that we make, uh, make judgments, plan behaviors. Uh, but we also have this memory system that's like really bad. <laughs> at picking up little pieces of information. If you don't know what's important and it changes, then you've missed something uh, really important, right? So we, in the door study, the information was missed. In the change blindness study, the information was missed. And a lot of these other examples uh, that we talked about, whether it's driving or so on, uh, we miss a lot of the information. And so we're always dealing with incomplete information. Uh, and then we rely on a heuristic that lets us rely on the thing that most easily comes to mind, which is sometimes not reflective of reality. All right, let's take a short break. Uh, how about 10.50-ish? Uh, we'll come back and finish the second half of class.